Hi, everyone. I'm Steve Adubato. Let's kick off this very important program talking public policy, particularly around infrastructure. That's right. We've got our good friend Greg Lalavie, business manager at the International Union of Operating Engineers, Local 825. Good to see you, Greg. Good to see you, too, Steve. Thanks for having me. Uh, another time, Greg and I will talk college basketball, an obsession of ours, but not on this show. Hey, Greg, listen, infrastructure, not sexy. We've been through it before. Biden, the infrastructure plan, the, the Northeast Corridor, the Amtrak money, the gateway. What does it really mean in terms of the economy, jobs, and our region? Well, there, there's a multiplier on infrastructure that's been consistent for decades. It provides an economic boost to the entire region. Uh, projects are done locally. You can't manufacture a road and ship it in. The products are mined locally. They're made locally. So it's infrastructure projects are a boost to the local economy. You, you referenced Northeast Corridor. 30% of the country's GDP travels the Northeast Corridor from Boston to Washington. So improving Amtrak's Northeast Corridor service is absolutely vital. And, and that means the Hudson Rail Tunnels and the Portal Bridge. Tell everyone what the International Union of Operating Engineers, Local 25 is. Um, I know that there's a significant, am I right about an anniversary, Greg? Uh, yeah, we just passed a, our 100 year anniversary. It was actually in uh, 2020. We delayed it, our celebration for a year, but we had it in uh, early November of 2021. Uh, we went through our entire history. It's an amazing history of our organization. And you asked the question we are 7,500 men and women who are known most for operating heavy construction equipment. We build the nation's infrastructure. And when we look back, at 100 years of projects, it's pretty astounding what we've been involved in over the years. Brother, Greg just gave me a book. Let me disclose, I, I um, teach a leadership academy at Local 825. And when I was leaving, Greg left me a book about the history of 825 and the International Union of Operating Engineers. I thought I knew, I did not. It is compelling. But, and then also, let's put up the website for uh, 825 so people can find out more. Greg, let, let's do this. Um, when it comes to the issue of climate change, we have a whole range of interviews. We do a lot of programming about energy policy, policy the, the governor, Governor Murphy's quote unquote energy master plan. We're actually doing an interview with the head of the BPU as we tape today, Joe Fiordaliso. What is the, the governor's master plan, energy master plan, A, from your perspective, and B, what concerns, if any, do you have about it? Well, the, the energy master plan talks about moving away from fossil fuels and moving into complete electrification, looking at the offshore wind and solar projects and things of that nature. Our concerns there are a few. One is the overall cost of the energy master plan. What will it cost the ratepayers? What will it cost the taxpayers? That's an unanswered question that we would really like to have the answer to. The other concern is the speed at which we think we can accomplish this electrification. While the, the schedule is very aggressive, we're not sure that it can be met. I think if everything is built out the way they tell us that it can get built out, we'll still land about 20% short of our energy needs. And where are we going to get that from? Uh, neighboring states are coming up with the same calculation, and we can't all get the 20, same 20% from the same place. So we have serious questions that we'd like to have answered uh, as it surrounds this energy master plan. L let me play devil's advocate here. And by the way, we're to, to also like, let everyone know that we are involved in a public awareness campaign about so-called clean energy, if you will. Um, but at the same time, here's the thing. So say you're concerned about climate change, and that's not say you are, you are. The governor is, the BPU, they are concerned as well. Lots of environmentalists, clearly. Is there such a thing as balance in this in terms of pursuing um, the aggressive fight against climate change, um, and at the same time being sensitive to jobs, the economy, and what's realistic here. And the final part of this, Greg, is in the Leadership Academy, I mentioned before, we talk about leading with a sense of urgency. Is the governor not simply leading with a sense of urgency here? Because climate change, we're playing catch up. Well, we agree, we agree with being urgent and responding to climate change. We just believe the existing technology and the existing infrastructure 
we have to acknowledge what's right for our economy and making sure that we have enough energy. We talk about bringing back manufacturing. We talk about smart development. Uh, all of that needs to be done, but it needs to be done in balance. Certainly with a, a change and a transfer over, the timeline is what really concerns us uh, because fossil fuels are being left at the door. And if we look at the amount of carbon that we've reduced as we've changed from coal to natural gas, it's significant. So we, we think that we can keep natural gas as a component of our energy portfolio for the foreseeable future. And yes, eventually it may wane and peter out, but for the timeline that's set, we believe it has a place and an absolute necessity to keep in the energy portfolio. It's gonna be a very interesting discussion moving forward and we'll stay on that, um, on that discussion from a policy perspective. Also, when I say policy, it's not just pie in the sky policy, it's policy that impacts people's lives uh, more directly. Let me ask you this, Greg, President Biden, to what degree do you, what grade do you give him, A and B, why? Uh, do you give him that grade when it comes to leading the infrastructure fight in this nation? Um, and also given how long it's taken to get anything done down there in Washington? Well, to, to give him a grade solely on infrastructure would be to give him an A. Uh, he got an infrastructure bill through and he did it more or less the old fashioned way. He brought in people from both parties, had a discussion, listened to concerns, had them exchange ideas, you referenced some of the dysfunction in Washington and an inability to get things done. The fact that this got done uh, was a testament to his leadership and the fact that he's listening and talking to people. Talk about the jobs that come out of this infrastructure, this $110 billion infrastructure initiative. Because sometimes the millions and trillions and billion people, huh? What does it mean? Talk jobs. Well, the jobs are going to be significant. We're going to have an opportunity to build out a lot of things. There's $7 billion for road work. New Jersey generally runs at about $2 billion per year. So infuse you know, another three and a half years of capital construction into, into the mix, and that's incredible. $4.2 billion in transit, $1.1 billion in bridges, we can talk about 500 structurally deficient bridges around the state of New Jersey. You can take a look at 495 in Hudson County, built in 1929, has almost 170,000 car trips per day. That thing's in need of serious upgrade. The way it was built, the way it was engineered back in 1930, uh, they did not anticipate this level of traffic or the beating that that bridge would take every year. Uh, separate and apart, Amtrak getting a large allocation. A few seconds, Greg. No, no, go ahead. Finish your point. Okay. A few seconds. Um, Amtrak's going to get a large allocation to uh, potentially complete the Gateway project. You know, all signs point to the, the Hudson Rail Tunnels being done. There, there's going to be more work in this area because of this infrastructure bill than I think we could ever imagine. Yeah, people can talk about infrastructure in the abstract and the amount of money being spent, but to understand the impact, particularly in the New York, New Jersey region, is critical. And Greg mentioned Amtrak. We'll be having Tony Kosha from Amtrak on to talk about that. Hey, Greg Lalavi, um, International Union of Operating Year, Engineers, Local 825. As always, thanks for joining us, Greg. Thanks, Steve. Great to be here. You got it. We'll be right back right after this. One on One with Steve Adubato has been a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation. Funding has been provided by the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey, IBEW Local 102, Eastern Atlantic States Regional Council of Carpenters, the New Jersey Education Association, the New Jersey Board of Public Utilities Clean Energy Program, the New Jersey Economic Development Authority, Valley Bank, Choose New Jersey, and by New Jersey Sharing Network. Promotional support provided by CIANJ and Commerce Magazine. And by Jaffe Communications. Hi, I'm Joe Roth. In New Jersey, there are nearly 4,000 residents in need of a life-saving organ transplant. And one person dies every three days waiting for this gift of life. One organ and tissue donor can save eight lives and enhance the lives of over 75 people. You have the power to make a difference and give hope. For information or to become an organ and tissue donor, visit www.njsharingnetwork.org. And be sure to talk with your family and friends about this life-saving decision.